The idea that Christianity was derived from the Egyptian religion has occurred to several Egyptologists over the years, but on the whole they have been understandably reluctant to stray outside their own areas of expertise and into Christian theology, for which reason it can't really be described as a mainstream position in scholarship. However, the internet is buzzing with the idea. It has recently been associated with the late D.M. Murdoch, who wrote several books on the subject and who was a staunch mythicist. We have a lot of textural and archaeological information about the ancient Egyptian civilization, but unfortunately their religious leaders seem to have been rather coy about writing down their beliefs, so we are dependent on a few scattered snippets from Egypt and later Greek sources. The Egyptian religion wasn't just one religion. Threads existed throughout Egypt, but there were many local variations, and the ancient Egyptian government never managed to unify religious belief. The civilization lasted for some 3,000 plus years, in an arid land largely irrigated by a river rather than precipitation, giving ideal conditions for preservation of ancient artefacts down the millennia. The upshot of this is that there is a large amount of information about diverse Egyptian religious practices, but it's often oblique and open to differing interpretations. This raises a note of caution when seeking any parallels with Christianity. It is an ideal situation to trawl for potential parallels that could have arisen by random chance. And then, by being highly selective in what data are presented, to come back with a convincing sounding argument that is in fact false. If that is indeed what happened, then countering it would be a huge task, because denying parallels between Christianity and the Egyptian religion would be insufficient, as there are likely to be multiple genuine parallels by chance. To counter the argument, you would have to show that those parallels are no more than would be expected randomly, given the body of information and its diversity. This is clearly a monumental task, and much greater than simply trawling through the evidence to find parallels. Now, you'll be pleased to know I don't propose to do that formally, but do bear in mind as I describe potential parallels that this is a significant risk. Much of what we know about Osiris comes from the pyramid texts, dating from 2350 to about 2175 BC, so of great antiquity, predating Jesus by longer than we postdate him today. The conventional understanding of the myth is that Osiris was the Egyptian god of the afterlife, the underworld, the dead, fertility, beauty, crop cycles and resurrection. He was variously the son of the god Geb or the sun god Ra and the sky goddess Nut. He was the brother and husband of Isis and the father of Horus. Osiris was killed by his brother Set, who wanted Osiris's underworld throne. His wife Isis found his body and hid it in reeds where it was found and dismembered by Set. Isis retrieved and joined together the pieces of Osiris but could not retrieve his penis which was swallowed by a fish. Isis fashioned a golden penis and briefly brought Osiris back to life using a spell that gave her enough time to become pregnant by him before he again died. Isis later gave birth to Horus. As such, since Horus was born after Osiris' resurrection, Horus became thought of as a representation of new beginnings and the vanquisher of the usurper Set. There are several versions of the Osiris myth. About 2,400 years after the Pyramid Texts, Plutarch has Osiris' brother Set and the Queen of Ethiopia conspiring with 72 accomplices to kill Osiris. Set tricked Osiris into getting into a box, which he then closed and threw into the Nile. Then Isis searched until she found the box in a tree which was holding up the roof of a palace. She removed the box, but inside she found Osiris dead. In another version, Isis is taught a spell by her father which can resurrect people temporarily. She uses the spell to bring Osiris back to life for long enough to impregnate her. Then Osiris died again and she hid his body. She conceived and bore Horus. Set came upon the body while hunting at night and flew into a rage. He tore the body up into 14 pieces and scattered them. Isis found all the parts except the penis that had been eaten by a fish and put them together for burial. Impressed with Isis' devotion, the gods resurrected Osiris, who then served as the god of the underworld. Yet another late version has Osiris as an earthly king who taught the Egyptians civilization. He then travelled the world with Isis and returned to Egypt where he was murdered by his brother Typhon, a Greek syncretism with Set. Typhon cut the body into 26 pieces, which he gave to the conspirators to implicate them in the murder. Isis and Hercules a Greek syncretism with Horus, then killed Typhon. 
Isis recovered all the body parts except the penis and buried them. She made replicas which she sent to places that became centres of Osiris worship. So you get the picture. Multiple versions of myths about multiple gods. By selecting bits from different versions, we can have Osiris as a man on earth who was killed, then resurrected, and then became lord of the afterlife. But that particular version is found nowhere in the ancient sources. And I regret that this same process is seen throughout scholarship that connects Jesus with Egypt. Other links between Osiris and Jesus can be made. None of them are total inventions, but they all involve variable degrees of data trawling and in some cases data torturing using strained or speculative interpretations. Such similarities include Eucharist-type meals, baptism, being born of a virgin and having twelve disciples. Osiris is typically shown with a crook and flail, tools of the shepherd, and is typically depicted with a pleated beard and long hair. So we have a bearded, long-haired shepherd figure. Sound familiar? Then there is the star in the east. Sirius is the brightest star in the night sky and was regarded by the ancient Egyptians as the star of Osiris. It's fairly close to the equator with a declination of about 17 degrees south. Like all stars, it can only be seen when it's in the visible sky during the night time. There is a period of 70 days each year when Sirius rises after the sun and sets before it, and so cannot be seen. After this period, the star reappears briefly by rising over the eastern horizon slightly earlier than the sun. This happens in the summer, currently in mid-August, and in antiquity it heralded the inundation of the Nile. Consequently, it was then the star in the east that heralded rebirth. And the analogy can be extended further. The three stars that form the belt of the constellation Orion line up fairly closely with Sirius. These stars are called, moving from east to west, Al-Nitak, Al-Nilam and Mintaka. Mintaka rises first, followed by Al-Nilam and Al-Nitak, about two and a half hours before Sirius. As the declination of Mintaka is zero degrees, it rises in the due east, significantly north of the rising point of Sirius. Nevertheless, the three stars, which have been referred to as the Three Kings, point towards the rising Sirius, though they lead rather than follow Sirius into the sky. But you get the idea. As I'm sure you know, the internet is awash with breathless theories about these four stars and the pyramids and the Milky Way and the sunrise and the procession of the equinox and Atlantis, etc. That we can leave, but the association of Sirius, Al-Nitak, Al-Nilam and Mintaka with Jesus can't be dismissed out of hand. There are similarities with rites. The Osiris cult held annual initiation passion plays symbolising the death and resurrection of Osiris, associated with the planting and sprouting of grain. Much of what we know of these plays comes from the Ikhernafret Stella of Abydos, erected around 1875 BC. Ikhernafret may have been a priest of Osiris. His Stella tells us that passion plays were put on in the last month of the annual inundation of the Nile, springtime, at Abydos, where tradition had it that the body of Osiris was washed up after being thrown into the Nile. The festival lasted five days. On the first day, the enemies of Osiris were defeated in mock battles and a procession was held to open the way. On the second day, the great procession of Osiris took place. His body was taken from his temple to his tomb via a boat on the Nile, which had to be defended against mock enemies. On the third day, Osiris was mourned and further enemies were destroyed. The fourth day and night were a vigil with prayers and funeral rites. The fifth day saw Osiris reborn at dawn, crowned, and a statue of him was taken to the temple. So there are Jesus parallels as well as differences. Osiris was in his temple one night, then taken to his tomb, where he spent three nights and two days after which he was resurrected at dawn. Jesus was on trial one night, after which he was crucified one day, then taken to his tomb, where he spent two nights and one day, after which his resurrection was discovered at dawn. There are more parallels, such as the sky goddess Nut, speaking from heaven, referring to Osiris, saying that, This is my son, who I caused to be born. He is the one I have desired, and with whom I have become content according to pyramid texts. Rather similar to Mark, who has God saying, You are my son who I love, with you I am well pleased, after Jesus was baptised. The problem with this list of Isis-Jesus parallels is that it doesn't exist anywhere in the Egyptian source material. It is comprised from disparate snippets of source material and the opinions of multiple Egyptological scholars. 
Jumping 1,500 years forward from the Ikernafret Stella, Alexander the Great invaded Egypt in 332 BC and incorporated it into the Macedonian Empire. Following his death in 323 BC, Egypt was taken over by the Ptolemies until Octavian, later to become Augustus, defeated Antony and Cleopatra in 30 BC and incorporated Egypt into the Roman Empire. This 300-year period saw Hellenic and Egyptian religious syncretism. The god Serapis was a syncretism of Osiris and the Greek god Apis. The cult of Serapis was probably in existence before the Alexandrian invasion, but it was promoted as a policy by the Ptolemies, with a large temple to Serapis, or a Serapion, being built in Alexandria. Serapis inherited many of the characteristics of Osiris, including the resurrection and fertility motifs. Moving forward again, in 356 AD, Constantinus II ordered the Egyptian temples of Isis and Osiris to be closed and forbade the use of hieroglyphics as a religious language. In 380 AD, Theodosius declared Christianity to be the official Roman state religion and all pagan cults were forbidden. In 391 AD, the Christian Plutarch of Alexandria, Theophilus, mustered monks to arms and turned them on Memphis and the shrine of Serapis, the Serapion. It was a brutal put-down, with numerous Egyptian priests being murdered in the shrines and streets. The Osiris cult continued on the island of Phyli, in the Upper Nile, where the Theodosian decrees were not enforced, until the cult was finally curtailed by Byzantine Emperor Justinian I in the 6th century. Turning now to the circumstantial evidence linking Osiris to Jesus, this is fair. We know that Osiris was worshipped over a prolonged period until the 4th century AD and not far from ancient Judea. We do not have much linking him more closely than that to Judaism and the Jews were fiercely opposed to other religions. It's true that the Bible tells a tale of bondage of Israelites in Egypt and then being led out by Moses but this story has not been corroborated with archaeological evidence and if it happened at all it was very early. It seems unlikely that the Egyptian religion had an influence on the founders of Christianity who were Jewish and not disposed to be sympathetic towards other religions. But it seems entirely credible that the process of forcible conversion of pagans to Pauline Christianity in the 4th century involved substantial syncretism between the two religions directly or via Serapis. Osiris was not one of hundreds of obscure gods. He was a key god in an important and widespread religion in the Roman Empire that was current in the first four centuries AD. He was therefore one amongst a small number of gods sharing the same circumstantial evidence. The exact number is debatable, but I'd say it was less than ten. So, with the Egyptian religion we have a lot of information but rather scattered in time, place and content. We have a number of parallels with Christianity. Some of these are impressive, such as celebration of Osiris' death and resurrection. Some intriguing, such as parallels between the star in the east and the three wise men, and Sirius and the three stars of Orion's belt. And some strained, such as having twelve disciples on being born of a virgin. There are parallels between Jesus and Osiris. The mythicist position is that Jesus was closely and causally related to Osiris, or some Osiris Horus synthesis. The Christian apologist position is that there were no significant similarities, and any apparent similarities are purely a consequence of data trawling and torturing by over-eager mythicists. The truth probably lies somewhere between these two extremes. And with the relatively good circumstantial evidence, it's my view that some parallels at least are causal rather than incidental. But the parallels we find concern things like the Trinitarian doctrine, the Solstice Festival, the virgin birth stars in the east and the resurrection. We do not find an earthly preacher and we find no trace of a crucifixion. So we do find evidence of influence from the Egyptian religion on non-Jewish Christianity, but this has little bearing on whether Jesus existed. For the Egyptian religion to have a bearing on that debate, it would have to have done one of two things, to provide a pre-existent Jesus character who was later euhemerized, or to provide an earlier example of euhemerization, and it doesn't convincingly do either of these. So what of a historical Jesus? Was the Jesus figure a consequence of syncretism, the cause of syncretism, or unrelated to it? The last one we can sidestep, because if true, it doesn't have a bearing on the debate. I'll look at hypothetical scenarios of the other two. 
Now, put yourself in the position of sitting in an ancient library somewhere in the 60s or 70s AD trying to work out the will of God. You've got Jewish, Egyptian, Mithraic, etc. text to consult. We'll start with the 70-year argument as a possible hypothetical scenario. The problem here is that the Jewish means of redemption via animal sacrifice has been curtailed by the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Surely God didn't really mean Jews were never more to be redeemed. What was needed was an outright purchase sacrifice rather than an annual rental scheme. What would be the price of such a sacrifice? It would have to be very valuable, ergo the son of God man. This can't be a timeless event, otherwise it would have made sacrifices before the temple's destruction pointless. It must therefore have been fixed in time. And if you've seen my video on the 70 year argument, you'll see how they could have reckoned that the sacrifice must have come into the world around 1 BC, been sacrificed around 30 BC, and the rest is simply filling in the details. Where do we find those details? We look for the way in which God has worked in other populations, and we find an incomplete and hitherto misunderstood version in Osiris. Now the core belief of Christianity is, sin is universal and leads to death unless atoned for. Your own sin is too great for you ever to atone for. The death of Jesus will atone for it, but you have to accept Jesus in order to escape its consequences. If this 70 year scenario is correct, then this core belief is a syncretism between the core of Judaism and the core of the Egyptian religions. Now, put yourself in the position of sitting in the ancient library somewhere in the 60s or 70s AD trying to work out the will of God. You've got your Jewish, Egyptian, Mithraic, etc. text to consult. But this time, you've also got statements and epistles about the recently crucified man, Jesus, who you believe in. Your task is to work this man into the God narrative. There were no good Jewish precedents for this kind of thing. Elijah did not die. Egyptian ideas are far more fruitful because you have these important gods being killed by enemies and resurrected with a clear message that death is simply a transition from one world to another. From this I can see where the entire Jesus story may have come from. So perhaps the syncretism between Jesus and Osiris actually favours historicity rather than mythicism. The core Christian belief in this case is still a syncretism of the core Jewish and core Egyptian beliefs, but this time the syncretism did not provide the Jesus character, it simply interpreted him. So are either of these scenarios anywhere near the truth, and if so, which one is closer? I'm afraid I'll have to leave you to decide that, as I think it's too close to call. In general, it's true that the later evolution of Christian theology and mythology has little bearing on the historicity or otherwise of Jesus.